In a world full of news of murder and mayhem some stories just really stick out. The three stories covered in this video shows just how low and debased a person can. Go! The cruelty and savagery of these crimes are beyond description. A son kills his mother to make it rain. A family's closet relative turns out to be their worst nightmare. A son turns a house of hope into a house of blood. When Kameen Wilson didn't show obvious grief at his mother's funeral, his cousin chalked it up to shock that he was just having trouble processing her death, numbed. Yolanda Holmes, a successful beauty shop owner in Chicago, was stabbed and shot too. Death in her Chicago apartment September 2, 2012, Holmes, a prominent beautician. Successful business owner and active member of the uptown community. She owned the popular beauty shop Nappy Heads at the funeral coming the rapper slash actor known as Young QC didn't sit in the front row of the church near Yolanda Holmes' casket and spent much of the service hanging outside, according to friends and relatives, some of whom found his behavior at the September 2012 funeral odd. The loss of Holmes stunned the uptown Chicago neighborhood. The North Side resident was a popular, community-minded figure who handed out school supplies to area children, hosted back-to-school parties, and ran a busy a beauty shop. Zion Banks, Holmes' a first cousin noticed Comain seemed a little distant. He didn't seem devastated, but after Holmes was buried the family still did not have a clue about who had killed Yolanda Holmes. Comain was known as a flashy guy and described by friends as charismatic he attended. A former classmate described him as a cool guy who yearned for attention, especially from the ladies, she said. Wilson later attended Sen High School in Edgewater. Some of his classmates at Sen said they found him to be full of himself. Others found him funny, energetic, and down-to-earth. One classmate said he was a cool dude who joked around and loved to dance in the hallways. She said he even came to her defense once when another student tried to beat her up. A longtime friend and former employee of Yolanda Holmes, Julie, who asked that her last name be withheld, said I heard he wanted to be famous. Comain was driven to be in Hollywood he produced and starred in multiple YouTube videos and also starred in The Nick Story, a family drama on YouTube. One week after Holmes' death, Comain Wilson liquidated his mother's bank accounts, collecting more than $90,000. He also was the Beneficiary of two of her life insurance policies, authorities allege in court documents. Numerous pictures and videos of him flaunting his lifestyle appear online within weeks of Holmes' murder. His Facebook, YouTube and Instagram accounts show examples of the lavish life he's lived in the last year. One Instagram picture shows Wilson at the Burberry store downtown laying a stack of cash out in front of a cash register. Another shows him at the wheel of a Mustang holding an expensive leather Versace Medusa head belt. There are pictures of him with an array of newly purchased Air Jordans. He brags about buying $1,500 puppies on social media and tells of his luxury cars, designer clothes, guns, and copious amounts of weed. There is also a video of him withdrawing a $20,000 in cash from a Chase bank and then throwing it in the air sending a crowd of his fans into a frenzy. 50-year-old Jefferson Park resident Tia Bouvier, former employee and longtime friend of Yolanda Holmes, said she remembered Wilson as a spoiled child who was well-treated by Holmes. Holmes bought her son a Camaro, kept him stocked with designer clothes, and helped him find jobs when he needed help, she stated. Even so, Bouvier said Wilson often exaggerated his mother's finances to other kids. She remembers overhearing Wilson, as a 16-year-old hanging outside his mother's salon, boasting to his friends, I got money. He bragged a lot that his mom had money and he was rich, she said. A video of Yun QC counting $20,000 withdrawn from Chase Bank to make it rain. Yun QC throwing $20,000 of his murdered mom's money into the street. Kameen Wilson was interviewed and spoke out about his mother's death a year ago, outside the highly publicized Hadiya Pendleton's funeral. My mother, she was a neighborhood woman. A guy entered her home and murdered her, he told WGN News, just to steal. 
While Wilson was known as a flashy guy before his mother died, his tastes grew noticeably more luxurious after she was murdered, according to his friends, former classmates, relatives, and friends of his mother. That in turn drew the attention of Chicago P.D. Wilson, was arrested December of 2014 and charged with murder and home invasion, Wilson Yin Q.C., enlisted the help of two other people to kill his mother Loriana Johnson, 23, and Eugene Spencer, 22, were all ordered held without bail for the slaying of Yolanda Holmes. The family of Yolanda Holmes were shocked and outraged she was a single parent who took so many steps to make sure he was okay, his cousin Zion Banks said he grew up loved. Wilson's father, Jeffrey Todd Wilson, is serving a life sentence in Statesville Correctional Center in Crest Hill, Illinois, for murder. The reputed West Side gang leader was arrested in 1993. Authorities accused him of setting fire to an apartment building in 1990 that killed two low-level crack house workers after the dealer who ran the drug den refused to pay a street tax of $500 to $1,000 a month. Uni Holmes, the victim's sister and Wilson's aunt, posted on Facebook on trying to figure out why he would do such a thing. She did everything for him. Wilson and his alleged accomplices Loriana Johnson, 23, and Eugene Spencer, 22, were all ordered held without bail for the slaying of Yolanda Holmes. The Monster at Home The Marcus Wesson Story Marcus Delon Wesson, born August 22, 1946, in Kansas to Benjamin and Carrie Wesson and raised as a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Wesson claimed that his father was abusive and his mother was a religious fanatic. By the early 1960s, the family had moved to San Bernardino, California. After dropping out of high school, Wesson joined the Army and was stationed in Europe. Shortly after returning to the U.S. and leaving the military, he became involved with Rosemary Solario, a married woman living in San Jose. Soon Solario broke up with her husband, and Wesson moved in with her and her children. In 1971, Solario gave birth to Wesson's son. At the same time, Wesson was cultivating a relationship with one of Solario's daughters Elizabeth, telling her that God had chosen her to be his bride. In 1974, at the age of nine, Elizabeth married 27-year-old Wesson in a home wedding ceremony. He began sexually abusing her at age 12. At age 15, they married legally when she became pregnant and, four months later, she gave birth to her first child. Eventually, the couple had ten children together, the one died as an infant. One of Elizabeth's younger sisters left her own seven children with them, claiming to be unable to care for them. Wesson never held a steady job and the family mostly lived off of welfare. They often lived in rundown shacks, boats, and vacant houses. Wesson was abusive toward his wife and children. He prevented Elizabeth from participating in the children's upbringing. He homeschooled the children and taught them from his own handwritten Bible that focused on Jesus Christ. Being a vampire. He told the children that he was God and had them refer to him as Master or Lord. He taught the children to be prepared for Armageddon and that the girls were destined to become Wesson's future wives. He separated the boys from the girls, fearing they would develop sexual feelings for each other. He had the boys stay in a shack in a heavily wooded area and the girls on a rundown boat for several months. Wesson sexually abused two daughters and three nieces, marrying in home ceremonies when they were around seven to nine years old. Each of the five girls became impregnated as a result of the incest. The mothers never disclosed the paternity of their children because Wesson threatened to harm them and the children if they did so. Court records indicate that Wesson fathered up to 18 children with seven women, including the five girls. In Fresno, California, prior to March 12, 2004, Wesson had declared his intention to relocate his daughters and their children to Washington State, where Wesson's parents lived. On March 12, 2004, several members of Wesson's extended family, along with two nieces who rebelled against Wesson, converged on his family compound demanding the release of their children by Wesson. Fresno, California police were summoned to what was described as a child custody issue, and a standoff ensued. Fresno police testified they did not hear gunshots being fired shortly after, though other witnesses present at the standoff testified they did hear gunshots fired at that time. 
In the aftermath, nine bodies of Wesson's daughters and their children were discovered in a bedroom filled with antique. Each victim had been shot through the eye. Wesson's other children, who were not present inside the house, survived the incident. At his trial, Wesson, represented by public defenders Peter Jones and Ralph Torres, presented the defense that his 25-year-old daughter Sabrina, whose 18-month-old son Marshy, Wesson's own son and grandson, was killed as well, had herself committed the murders, and then subsequently committed suicide. The murder weapon, a .22 caliber handgun, was found with her body, and Sabrina's DNA was found on the gun, which lent credence to Wesson's claim. The jury declined to find that Wesson fired the fatal shots, but convicted him of murder anyway, presumably finding that he had persuaded his children to enter into a suicide pact. Wesson was convicted of nine counts of first-degree murder on June 17, 2005, and also found guilty on 14 counts of forcible sexual assault and the sexual molestation of seven of his daughters and nieces. Wesson was sentenced to death on June 27, 2005. The House of High Hopes It was another routine evening at the Suffolk County, New York, emergency dispatch switchboard. Calls had not been pouring in, and anyway, this placid New York City suburb scarcely had any crime to complain of, at least by city standards. Suddenly, at 6.35 p.m., the comm was destroyed by a phone call that would shatter the safe suburban aura that pervaded the county. Transcripts from the conversation demonstrate the caller's rattled composure as he tried to relate to an operator the horrifying scene he and his friends had been led to. Operator, this is Suffolk County Police. May I help you? Man, we have a shooting here. Ah, DeFeo. Operator, sir, what is your name? Man, Joey Yeswit. Operator, can you spell that? Man, yeah. Y-E-S-W-I-T. Operator, Y-E-S. Man, Y-E-S-W-I-T. Operator. W-I-T. Your phone number? Man, I don't even know if it's here. There's, ah, uh, I don't have a phone number here. Operator, okay, where are you calling from? Man, it's in Amityville. Call it the Amityville Police, and it's right off. Uh, Ocean Avenue in Amityville. Operator, Austin? Man, Ocean Avenue. What the? Operator, Ocean. Avenue? Off of where? Man, it's right off Merrick Road. Ocean Avenue. Operator, Merrick Road. What's, what's the problem, sir? Man, it's a shooting. Operator, there's a shooting. Anybody hurt? Man, ha. Huh? Operator, anybody hurt? Man, yeah, it's a, uh, a, uh, everybody's dead. Operator, what do you mean, everybody's dead? Man, I don't know what happened. Kid come running in the bar. He says everybody in the family was killed, and we came down here. Operator, hold on a second, sir. Police officer now takes over call. Police officer, hello. Man, hello. Police officer, what's your name? Man, my name is Joe Yeswit. Police officer, George Edwards? Man, Joe Yeswit. Police officer, how do you spell it? Man, what? I just... How many times do I have to tell you? Y-E-S-W-I-T. Police officer, where are you at? Man, I'm on Ocean Avenue. Police officer, what number? Man, I don't have a number here. There's no number on the phone. Police officer, what number on the house? Man, I don't even know that. Police officer, where are you at? Ocean Avenue and what? Man, in Amityville. Call up the Amityville police and have someone come down here. They know the family. Police officer, Amityville. Man, yeah, Amityville. Police officer, okay. Now, tell me what's wrong. Man, I don't know. Guy come running in the bar. 
Guy come running in the bar and said there, his mother and father are shot. We ran down to his house and everybody in the house is shot. I don't know how long, you know. So, uh, police officer, uh, what's the ad? What's the address of the house? Man, uh, hold on. Let me go look up the number. All right. Hold on. 112 Ocean Avenue, Amityville. Police officer, is that Amityville or North Amityville? Man, Amityville. Right on, south of Merrick Road. Police officer, is it right in the village limits? Man, it's in the village limits, yeah. Police officer, ah, okay, what's your phone number? Man, I don't even have one. There's no number on the phone. Police officer, all right, where are you calling from? Public phone? Man, no, I'm calling right from the house because I don't see a number on the phone. Police officer, you're at the house itself? Man, yeah. Police officer, how many bodies are there? Man, I think, uh, I don't know, uh, I think they said four. Police officer, there's four? Man, yeah. Police officer, all right, you stay right there at the house and I'll call the Amityville Village PD, and they'll come down. By the end of the evening, police investigators would find an additional two bodies, bringing the Ocean Avenue death toll to six. Six of seven members of the Ronald DeFeo family had been methodically murdered as they slept in their beds, leaving Ronald DeFeo, Jr., as the sole survivor of the grisly suburban bloodbath. Ronald DeFeo, Sr. thought he had attained the American dream when he purchased the Trophy Size House 112, Ocean Avenue in Amityville, Long Island. Having been born and raised in Brooklyn, Ronald had worked hard in his father-in-law's Brooklyn Buick dealership and after many years began to reap rich benefits. Money was no longer a concern when he finally made the decision to leave the city and move to Long Island. The home he chose was a classic piece of Americana, two stories plus an attic, several rooms, and a boathouse on the Amityville River. There was plenty of room for him, his wife Louise, and five children. A signpost in the front yard read High Hopes, a testament to what the new home had symbolized for the DeFeos. But beneath the veneer of success and happiness, Ronald was a hot-tempered man, given to bouts of rage and violence. There were stormy fights between him and Louise, and he loomed before his children as a demanding authority figure. As the eldest child, Ronald, Jr., bore the brunt of his father's temper and expectations. As a young boy, Ronald, Jr., or Butch as he would come to be called, was overweight and sullen, the victim of schoolyard taunts and unpopular with other children. His father encouraged him to stick up for himself, but while his advice pertained to the treatment of schoolyard bullies, it apparently did not apply to how young Ronald was treated at home. Ronald, Sr., had no tolerance for backtalk and disobedience, keeping his eldest son on a short leash and refusing to let him stand up for himself the way he was commanded to at school. As Butch matured shouting matches often degenerated into boxing matches as father and son came to blows with little provocation. Ronald, Sr. realized that his son's bouts of temper and violent behavior were highly irregular, even in relation to his own. He and his wife arranged for their son to visit a psychiatrist, but to no avail as Butch simply employed a passive-aggressive stance with his therapist and rejected any notion that he himself needed help. With no other solution, the DeFeos employed a time-honored strategy for placating unruly children. They started buying Butch anything he wanted and giving him money. At the age of 14, his father presented him with a $14,000 speedboat to cruise the Amityville River. Whenever Butch wanted money, all he had to do was ask, and if he wasn't in the mood to ask, he simply took it. By the age of 17, Butch was forced to leave the parochial school he was attending. By this time he had begun using serious drugs such as heroin and LSD and had also started dabbling in petty thievery schemes. His violent behavior was becoming increasingly psychotic as well and was not confined to outbursts within his home. One afternoon while out on a hunting trip with some friends, he pointed his loaded rifle at a member of their party, a young man he had known for years. He watched with a stony expression as the young man's face turned white. 
he fled, and Butch calmly lowered his gun. When they caught up with their friend later that afternoon, Butch asked him why he had left so soon. At the age of 18, Butch was given a job at his grandfather's Buick dealership. By his own account it was a gravy job, where little was expected of him. Regardless of whether or not he showed up for work, he received a cash allowance from his father at the end of each week. This he used for his car, which his parents had also purchased, for alcohol, and for drugs such as speed and heroin. Altercations with his father were growing ever more frequent and correspondingly more violent. One evening, a fight broke out between Mr. and Mrs. DeFeo. In order to settle the matter, Butch grabbed a 12-gauge shotgun from his room, loaded a shell into the chamber, and charged downstairs to the scene of the altercation. Without hesitating or calling out to break up the fight, Butch pointed the barrel of the gun at his father's face, yelling, Leave that woman alone. I'm going to kill you, you fat of asterisk asterisk asterisk. This is it. Butch pulled the trigger, but the gun mysteriously did not go off. Ronald, Sr. froze in place and watched in grim amazement as his own son lowered the gun and simply walked out of the room with casual indifference to the fact that he had almost killed his father in cold blood. That fight was over, but Butch's actions foreshadowed the violence he would soon unleash not only upon his father, but his entire family. In the weeks before the killings, relations between Butch DeFeo and his father had reached the breaking point. Butch, apparently dissatisfied with the money he earned from his father, had devised a scheme to further defraud his family. Two weeks before the slayings, Butch was sent on an errand by one of the staff at the Buick dealership, given the responsibility of depositing $1,800 in cash and $20,000 in checks in the bank. Instead, Butch arranged to be robbed on his way to the bank by an acquaintance, with whom he later split the cash. On the Friday before the murders, Butch had been asked by the police to examine some mud shots and the possibility that he might be able to finger the thief. He initially agreed, but pulled out at the last minute. When Ronald, Sr. heard of this, he confronted his son at work, demanding to know why he wouldn't cooperate with the police. You've got the devil on your back, his father screamed at his son. Butch didn't hesitate. You fat prick, I'll kill you. He then ran to his car and sped off. This fight had not come to blows. But the final confrontation was imminent. The still shroud of night blanketed the village of Amityville in the early morning hours of Thursday, November 14, 1974. Stray house pets and the odd car were the only signs of life as families and neighbors slumbered. But hatred and savagery were brewing beneath the seeming calm at 112 Ocean Boulevard. The entire DeFeo family had gone to bed, with the exception of Butch. As he sat in the quiet of his room, he knew what he wanted to do, what he in fact was going to do. His father and his family would be a nuisance to him no longer. Butch was the only member of the family with his own room. It afforded him a private storage place for a number of weapons he collected and sometimes sold. On the night of the murders, Butch selected a .35 caliber Marlin rifle from his closet and set off, stealthily but resolutely, towards his parents' bedroom. He quietly pushed aside the door to their room and momentarily observed them as they slept, unaware of the horror at the foot of their bed. Then, without hesitation, Butch raised the rifle to his shoulder and pulled the trigger, the first of eight fatal shots he would fire that night. This first shot ripped into his father's back, tearing through his kidney and exiting through his chest. Butch fired another round, again hitting his father in the back. This shot pierced the base of Ronald, senior's spine, and lodged in his neck. By now, Louise DeFeo had roused herself, and had barely a few seconds to react before her son began to fire upon her. Butch aimed the weapon at his mother as she lay prone on her bed, and fired two shots into her body. The bullets shattered her rib cage and collapsed her right lung. Both bodies now lay silently in fresh pools of their own blood. Despite the distinct snap of each rifle shot, no one else stirred in the house. Butch quickly surveyed the destruction he had wrought, before resuming his massacre of the innocent. His two young brothers, John and Mark, would be the next victims of Butch's murderous sense of self-righteousness and rage. Mark and John Matthew DeFeo, victims. 
He entered the bedroom the two boys shared and stood between their two beds. Standing directly above his two helpless brothers, Butch fired one shot into each of the boys as they lay sleeping. The bullets tore through their young bodies, ravaging their internal organs, laying waste to the lives that lay ahead of them. Mark lay motionless, while John, whose spinal cord had been severed by his brother's heartless attack, twitched spasmodically for a few moments after the shooting. Again, the shots had not roused the only remaining members of the DeFeo family, and Butch skulked unchallenged to the bedroom his sisters Dawn and Allison shared. Dawn was the closest in age to Butch, while Allison was in grade school with John and Mark. As Butch entered the room, Allison stirred and looked up just as he lowered the rifle to her face and pulled the trigger. His youngest sister was murdered instantly. Butch aimed his weapon at Dawn's head as well, literally blowing the left side of her face off. It was just after 3 a.m. In a span of less than 15 minutes, Ronald Butch DeFeo, Jr., had brutally slain each defenseless member of his family in cold blood. The DeFeo's dog Shaggy was tied up out by the boathouse and was barking violently in reaction to the brutality occurring in the house. His barking didn't distract Butch one bit, however. Aware that he had completed the task he had set out to do, he now turned his attention to cleaning himself up and establishing an alibi to throw the inevitable police investigation off the trail. Butch calmly showered, trimmed his beard, and dressed in his jeans and work boots. He then collected his bloody clothing and the rifle, wrapped them up in a pillowcase, and headed out to his car. He threw the evidence into the car, and took off into the pre-dawn hours before sunrise. Butch drove from the suburbs into Brooklyn, and disposed of the pillowcase and its contents by casting them into a storm drain. He then returned to Long Island, and reported to work at his grandfather's Buick dealership, business as usual. It was 6 a.m. Butch did not remain at work for long. He called home several times, and when his father failed to show up, he acted as though he were bored with nothing to do, and left around noon. After spending the rest of the evening with friends drinking, and getting high on heroin. After 6 p.m., Butch stated his concern over his inability to reach anyone at home. I'm going to have to go home and break a window to get in, he told a friend. Butch exited the bar acting as if he was on his on his way to try and figure out what was going on at home, only to return within a few minutes in a state of agitation and dismay. Bob, you gotta help me, he implored. Someone shot my mother and father. Fifteen hours after the gruesome slayings the two friends were joined by a small group of patrons, and they all piled into Butch's car, with Bobby at the wheel. Bobby Kelsky had entered the front door and raced upstairs into the master bedroom. There lay the bodies of Ronald, Sr., and his wife, Louise. He returned outside to find Butch beside himself with ostensible grief and dismay. Joey Yeswood had found the telephone in the kitchen and was calling the police. Within ten minutes the first policeman was on the scene, Officer Kenneth Gaguski. As he arrived, he found a group of men gathered on the DeFeo's front lawn. Butch was among them, sobbing uncontrollably. My mother and father are dead, he said as Gaguski approached the group. After Butch submitted his signed statement, the detectives continued to question him about his family, as investigators continued to examine physical evidence, both at the crime scene and in the police laboratory. A crucial discovery was made around 2.30 a.m., November 15th, when Detective John Sherville was making a last sweep through the DeFeo bedrooms. Rooms where the murders had taken place had been scoured thoroughly, while Ronald's room had so far been given a cursory once-over. But, upon a second look, Detective Sherville spotted a pair of rectangular cardboard boxes, both with labels describing their recent contents, Marlin rifles, a .22 and a .35. Sherville was unaware that a .35 caliber Marlin had been the murder weapon, but snagged the boxes anyway in the event that they may be important evidence. Indeed they were. Shortly after arriving at police headquarters with the new evidence, Sherville learned exactly what make of weapon had been used in the murders. Subsequent questioning of Bobby Kelsky led to the discovery that Butch was a gun fanatic and that he had staged the robbery of the Brigante Buick receipts. The detectives on the case began to seriously consider the possibility that Butch had been lying to them and that he may be their main suspect. 
Butch's story began to crumble. Dunn and Rafferty hammered at the discrepancies between Butch's stated version of the events and what the physical evidence led police to believe actually happened. Butch DeFeo's case came to trial on Tuesday, October 14, 1975, almost one year after the murders took place. November 21, 1975, Ronald DeFeo, Jr., was found guilty of six counts of second-degree murder. Two weeks later he was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison on all six counts. He remains incarcerated with the New York State Department of Corrections today. The true story of the murders that occurred at 112 Ocean Avenue inspired a runaway bestseller The Amityville Horror and was made into a popular movie. Epilogue The stories covered in this ebook tells more than anything the evil men can do to other men, women and children money, fame and fortune. Kameen Wilson is a classic example of a spoiled child gone rotten, as friend of mine suggested on Facebook his name in jail is probably going to be Amanda. Marcus Wesson is the poster boy for evil and may his punishment be swift and just. Ronald Butch DeFeo again shows how far a spoiled child will go to have it all.